Hey, hey, what's up, Mike? This is Guys, welcome back to the channel. Today's episode is the Home Networking Build Guide 2024. This video will show you how to set up a home network regardless of the size or type of home you live in. And we're gonna cover all aspects of the home networking build process, from how to choose your networking hardware, how to extend your wired and wireless network range, how to optimize and secure your home network, and much more. This video is a culmination of five years of setting up home networks on my YouTube channel. And we're gonna cover many different topics. But good news, this video is broken down into seven different sections. So you can find the topic or topics you wanna watch or rewatch again. And guys, if you don't know this, my name is Mike. I love technology, I love networking, I love computer builds, I love TVs, gaming consoles, all things technology. If you enjoy these things as well, make sure to hit subscribe and the bell notifications. And while you're there, give a thumbs up and share this video. All right, section one, evaluating your home networking environment and your home networking hardware. Your home environment will determine your hardware needs. The larger the home environment typically means the more hardware you're gonna need. Consider square footage and don't forget to include your basement and how many stories you have. More rooms means more wired connections and or extending your wireless coverage area. Also, where does your ISP come into the house? Some homes have a dedicated network enclosure and some do not. The last two homes that I lived in, both had network enclosures, one small and one large. If your ISP runs on a coax, like Cox Cable, then you can set up your home network in any room that has a coax outlet. Make sure to build your home network in an area that's free of clutter and has room for multiple devices as well as many power outlets. Stay away from kitchens because the microwaves can interfere with the 2.4 gigahertz band. Also consider adding a backup power supply to keep your network up and running when there's a power outage. And for larger homes, and especially two-story homes, you'll most likely need two access points to cover all areas. So let's talk about ISPs for a minute. Internet service providers. An ISP can set up your home network in multiple ways, depending on what your ISP offers and how complex your needs might be. However, you'll most likely need to buy additional equipment to extend access to more devices. Some ISPs will provide a single CPE device to cover all these networking functions. This type of device is an all-in-one. It's a modem and a wireless router combo with additional LAN ports for more wired devices. A word of warning about these all-in-one devices, these devices are typically limited in features and capabilities and I don't recommend them. Other providers, however, may only provide a single access device like a modem or a fiber ONT. And these devices have no additional networking capabilities requiring users to build out their networks. And that's why you're watching this video. Additionally, these ISPs may charge you for these devices or rent them to you for a monthly fee. I would just purchase the devices to save money in the long run. But if you like it simple and easy, then go with the ISP devices. And that brings us to home networking hardware. When setting up a home network, consider the four following hardware components. First is access devices, typically a cable modem, fiber ONT, or DSL modem. And yes, there still is DSL somewhere. The second device is a router to direct traffic in and out of your network. This device could be a VPN router, a wireless router, or a gaming router. For smaller single story homes, apartments, or condominiums, a decent wireless router is all you need because it will serve both wired and wireless devices. And make sure to match your home square footage with the correct wireless router. Typically, the square footage number is on the box. And don't get too much coverage because you don't want your signal broadcasting to all your neighbors. All right, the third device is a switch. Switches connect additional wired clients to the LAN ports on the router. Switches are available in both managed and unmanaged varieties. An unmanaged switch is typically less expensive and usually offers minimal features. And to be honest, they're basically a plug and play. These are typically sold in five and eight port versions and cost between two and three dollars per port. Not bad. Now a managed switch is more expensive because they have more features and capabilities. For instance, these types of switches have VLANs and have the ability to segment or block traffic to wired clients. And some managed switches will provide PoE ports power over ethernet. This delivers power to devices like APs and PoE cameras. PoE can power these devices, so an additional electrical port is not required. This is especially helpful for PoE cameras. So choose an unmanaged switch for a quick and easy setup. TP-Link and Netgear have great models. And choose a managed switch if you want full control of the traffic on your switch. Once again, TP-Link and Netgear have great models. Our fourth and last device 
is an access point. An access point connects wireless clients, like cell phones, laptops, and TVs. And PoE powered access points are much easier to install because it only requires one wire to power it and send and receive data, making the installation very easy. And you can install several APs depending on the size of your home. Typically a two-story home would have two APs, one on the first floor and then one on the second floor. However, if you have a wireless router on the first floor, then install an AP on the second floor for optimal coverage. All right guys, section two, weighing wired devices versus wireless devices. Generally speaking, wired devices provide better performance stability, and quality of service than wireless devices. But that upside comes with a potential higher cost, difficulty running ethernet cables through the walls and ceilings, and usually less flexibility. However, wireless devices can be moved around anywhere, but can provide lower and spottier performance, especially when trying to access larger files or participate in a video conference call or online gaming. It's really a performance versus convenience decision. And most homes are a hybrid of both wired and wireless. It just makes sense. Typical wired devices include desktop computers, TVs, and streaming boxes, like a Roku or Apple TV. These wired devices have an RJ45 connector that enables a connection to an ethernet cable, like Cat5e or Cat6. Some devices include both wired and wireless connections, like a desktop computer or a TV. But whenever possible, always use a wire connection over wireless. You'll have a faster, more secure, and stable connection. It's just the facts. Typical wireless devices are laptops, tablets, cell phones, TVs, gaming consoles, and IoT devices, like thermostats, lights, some security cameras, and even garage door openers. And FYI, almost all of these IoT devices run on the 2.4 gigahertz band. Typically, IoT devices do not work on the five gigahertz band. All right, guys, section three, Connecting wired clients. Connecting a wired client is pretty straightforward. Use an RJ45 network cable, connect one end to the device, and connect the other end to a switch or LAN port on the router. And that's it. Just about every router supports gigabit ethernet, which is 1000 megabits per second. And if all your devices support gigabit ethernet, which they should, you could achieve 1000 megabits per second. And these speeds can be achieved with a Cat5e cable or Cat6 with no problem. So don't bother with a Cat8, it's overkill. And FYI, Cat5e performs well in shorter runs. However, Cat6 performs better in longer runs, up to 328 feet. All right guys, section four, connecting wireless clients. First of all, you're gonna need wireless capability from your wireless router or access point, or both, in order to connect to wireless clients like a cell phone. And make sure to set up a solid password for your SSID. Don't use password for password. Otherwise, this could potentially compromise your network. And Wi-Fi has different generations, Wi-Fi 5, Wi-Fi 6, Wi-Fi 6E, and even Wi-Fi 7. So if you have a Wi-Fi 6E wireless router, some of your devices may support this version. For instance, this Samsung S23 is Wi-Fi 6E ready, which means it has the ability to connect to the six gigahertz band. And speaking of bands, wireless devices will work on three different bands the 2.4, the 5, and the 6 gigahertz band. And the 5 gigahertz band shouldn't be confused with 5G because 5G is a cell phone standard, not a wireless standard. The 2.4 gigahertz band is the lower band and is the most popular band because this band can travel further and through walls, which makes it great for all your wireless devices and including your IoT devices. The 5 gigahertz band has higher bandwidth and more throughput, but the trade-off is the 5 gigahertz band doesn't travel as far. And lastly, the 6 gigahertz band is the newest band, and it's even faster than the 5. But once again, it has a shorter range and has a hard time going through walls and ceilings. All right guys, section five, which is my favorite, extending your home network range. In many situations, your modem and router is in the main living area or the living room, and perhaps far away from your home office or other bedrooms. When extending your network range, the first step is to make sure your modem and router are optimized for best performance. And your ISP should ensure that your modem is optimized. An online speed test can help verify the performance between the router and the modem. The next step will be reaching those faraway spots in your home with APs. In this case, a wired ethernet connection is your best bet. Additionally, ethernet can be extended via power line adapter, which uses your home electrical wiring. The third choice to extend your Wi-Fi coverage is a mesh Wi-Fi system. And this mesh Wi-Fi system is wireless and does not use ethernet cables. And a great example of a mesh Wi-Fi system is Netgear Orbi. They're fantastic and reliable. These network extension capabilities have their pros and cons, but ethernet cabling is always the best bet. But the single greatest benefit of using an ethernet cable to extend your home network is the cable does not need to be connected to just one client. It can be attached to a switch. By extending your network out beyond the router with an ethernet cable and then adding a switch, other multiple wired clients can be added in a different location 
in the home. And from a PoE switch, PoE wireless access points can be added easily, which brings Wi-Fi to the remote parts of your home via ethernet cable. All right guys, section six, protecting your home network. Whether you're using your ISP's router capabilities or buying your own wireless router, securing your network is of vital importance when setting up your home network. This means setting up passwords on devices and changing default passwords on any device accessing or controlling the network. Also, make sure the firewall is active on your router. A firewall is designed to only allow certain traffic through and then block the rest. Within any router, virtual ports are used for different applications. For example, web traffic uses port 80. Secure web traffic uses port 443. And games and streaming devices have their own set of port numbers. Ensuring that you only open the minimum number of firewall ports will help keep you safer in the long run. And check to make sure the remote access to the cable modem and router is disabled. And lastly, strong WPA3 or WPA2 passwords is a must for a strong and secure home network. All right guys, last section, section seven, optimizing your home network. A final consideration for building a home network is optimizing the performance. And performance is measured in several different ways, including the following, bandwidth, which is measured in megabits per second, latency, which is how long it takes a packet to arrive, and is measured in milliseconds. And lastly, jitter, which is the amount of variance in the latency, and is measured in milliseconds as well. Most network speed tests will provide you this information. So as you make changes to your network, you can test to see if those changes are making a difference or not. Much of the optimization will happen on the Wi-Fi side because Wi-Fi has more variables to assign. For example, the physical layout of your home can affect your performance. And even obstacles like walls, glass, and even microwave ovens can add interference. Knowing which Wi-Fi channels your neighbors are on can also help optimize your performance. For the 2.4 gigahertz band, a best practice is using channel one, six, or 11 because they're non-overlapping channels. Once you have your network infrastructure optimized, it's time to optimize applications. The process can start by assigning QoS, quality of service, which is typically done in the router. QoS enables certain packets to have higher priority based on their packet type. In this step, you can assign a higher priority for a video or VoIP traffic so that a game or a large download file does not affect the video conference quality. Every router has a different method for QoS, so consult your manual. So guys, remember, I answer all questions, so feel free to ask in the comments below. And with that being said, make sure to like, share, subscribe, and comment. And for God's sakes, slap the bell icon. And I'll see you in the next video real soon. Peace.